everybody to today's session. Next up, let me introduce our presenters today and then we'll move into the actual presentation. Our presenters today are Emerus Treasures and Lisa Jennings. Emerus is with the USDA Forest Service Southern Research Station. He's with the Eastern Forest Environmental Threat Assessment Center and is the project coordinator for TACAMO, which is the template for assessing climate change impacts and management options. And Lisa is with the North Carolina State University and also associated with the Eastern Forest Environmental Threat Assessment Center. And she is the content manager for TACAMO. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emerus. Thanks, Bob. And I, I would also um, like to begin by thanking our hosts as well as all the participants for joining us today. Uh, today we, we're going to present a brief background on TACAMO as well as a few case studies about how it has been used and if time permits, we'll conduct a live demo. Um, to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge a few key individuals that make TACOMO possible. First, uh, I'm joined by my co-presenter, Lisa Jennings. And uh, as uh, Bob indicated, she is a climate change outreach spe specialist with North Carolina State University. And she manages the TACOMO content. The development team also includes um, Steve McNulty, who is our supervisory ecologist and principal investigator. Jennifer Moore Myers is our GIS specialist and geospatial content manager. Rob Herring is our web application developer. And Nancy Grolke and Lisa Baldeman support TACAMO through the Western Threat Center for Western regions. Um, the Region 8 National Forest System applications team includes Chris Liggett, who is the planning director and co-principal investigator for TACAMO, as well as David Merriweather and Paul Arndt, who have helped design and implement TACAMO from the beginning. I also want to recognize our users from across the region and across the nation who have helped mold TACAMO into what you will see today. I would like to establish a few expectations about what we will cover in this webinar. We will explore TACAMO and describe how it can help natural resource professionals and others consider climate change implications for their work. We will not try to convince you that climate change is real or go into the minutia of carbon markets or greenhouse gas mitigation. So we probably won't answer questions about those either. That said, we want this to be fun and, intera and, an, and an interactive webinar. So please join. Um, use the laugh icons or type laugh out, laugh out loud in the chat box so that we know our, our well thought out jokes aren't going unnoticed. And then in line with that, um, we want you know, to, to really emphasize that most of what we will cover today are good forest management resources regardless of climate change. To start things off, we're, we're going to do a quick poll. And most of you are familiar with how to do that already from the polls that, that we started with. So as we go through this presentation, we'll pause several times and ask polling questions like this one. In this question, we want to know how important reading scientific papers is to your work. And it looks like everyone's had an opportunity to respond. So as you can see, most of you indicate that um, it's extremely or at least moderately important. And so you already understand how challenging it is to stay current as new science emerges, not to mention finding the information specific to your need from that which already exists. We will describe how TACIMA can help with this. For those few of you who have indicated less important, I think you will see that TACIMA is a resource that can make this information more accessible than ever before. Perhaps it's not the scientific literature isn't important, it's just not been made available in a form that is very applicable to your need. And we'll, we'll ask one more question. Similar to the previous poll, how many of you um, have reviewed scientific papers about climate change, or how many papers, rather, in the last six months? Okay, we can go ahead and publish the results from that poll. Um, looks like we're in the one to five category. Uh, so on average, across all of the content TACAMO, or the 
content developers for Tacoma, we read between 10 and 20 papers per week. In the last year, over 500 papers have been reviewed. Our content manager also receives about 100 literature alerts per week, which means we are carefully monitoring emerging science. I'm quickly going to review the, just the basic inputs and outputs of Tacomo, and Lisa will go into more detail on uh, about each of these. The public-facing Tacomo website provides an interface for accessing science and planning content through exploration and report generation tools. The website also serves as an efficient means for connecting users with Tacomo support services and links to other external resources. Content is structured around a dynamic science delivery framework containing three general content areas. These are depicted along the top of the diagram. Geospatial science includes temperature and precipitation data as well as derivative models. Literature-based science includes an extensive and growing inventory of peer-reviewed literature, as we just discussed during the previous poll question. Forest plan components, or the decision elements of forest planning for the Forest Service, are also organized and compiled for selected regions of the National Forest System, including regions 8 nine, and 9. The public-facing Tacoma website includes informative views into, these, into this information, including the Explore module, and these are depicted across the bottom, which enables easy and intuitive user orientation and self-education. The Generator Report module produces structured and exportable documents through a series of basic selections. So why Tacoma? Well, federal and state agencies engaged in everything from strategic planning to project level analysis are under pressure from both legal requirements and the public to consider climate change. For the Forest Service, this includes the new planning rule and the climate change performance scorecard. Common to everyone, however, is the demand for credible, concise, and current information. Complicating this need is a rapidly growing and ever increasing change in the body of knowledge. At this point, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Lisa, who will share some more specific information. Thanks, Emrys. Well, Emrys did a great job identifying you know, why we need Tacomo and our um, development history. But how Tacomo meets this need is that we highlight the elements from the wealth of information, but with a natural resource management eye. So we really try to pay attention to those boots on the ground items that are really useful. We also have a team of full-time content developers that allow for content to be added um, routinely into Tacomo and also allow us to reorganize the information in there based on user feedback. So Tacomo is always growing. It's not a static document. And each day you'll find new papers and new quotes in Tacomo. So what's available on the website? Well, right now we have over 2,800 quotations describing the effects of climate change. And we also have 700 quotations describing adaptive management options. Now, these quotations are taken from papers in the way most people do a literature review, highlighting the important information and capturing that within our website for people to access. These come from 700 or more peer-reviewed source papers, and we do hold ourselves to a peer review standard. And in those papers, we also link out to citations for almost 3,000 supporting literature documents. And these are the um, parenthetical citations that will exist within a quote that may reference to some historical papers or perhaps some non-peer reviewed papers that add more substance. So there's really a lot of information captured. Organize this content in a way that's easy for our users to access through resource areas, or what we call factors. And within those factors, we also have categories, which are more specific. And then we um, cache which geographic region it's in as well. As Emra said, we also um, include forest plannings from national forests. And we have 36 national forest plans right now with over 12,000 desired conditions, objectives, and design criteria. And those are kind of the key language elements of the plan. We also have an extensive geospatial uh, database, um, which includes three GCM models and PRISM historic data, as well as over 87 supporting resource areas. And some of these resource areas are derivative models that take into account climate change, while other ones are just context layers, you know, something like national forest boundaries or perhaps 
um, the range of a spotted owl, something to give context to what you're viewing. These are the resource areas we cover. And I'm guessing that everybody should be able to find something that they relate to here. We really cover all of the grounds of natural resource management, from just general climate trends, which is really precipitation, temperature, and atmospheric trends, to things that we really manage for recreation, water resources vegetation management, which includes carbon sequestration, and even the more biological things such as freshwater ecosystems, plant communities, soils, and coastal ecosystems. So we really try to put this in, in terms that relate to these uh, resource areas more than just a general climate change. On the website, we also uh, include resources for training and assistance that are embedded in all our websites. And the point of this is that anybody should be able to come to Tacomo without prior knowledge, use the tool, and get the information they need. So we have interactive help buttons. We have short videos throughout the site, feedback links, and of course, a little disclaimer of how you should consider this information that we'll talk about later. We also offer a comprehensive user guide, example case studies, and we are always here for support. You can call us or email us anytime. So how is Takamo used? Well, as Emrys had mentioned, um, our main development focus was for the National Forest Land and Management Plan and to support the revisions there. So we've been used in the George Washington National Forest revision that was in the Mid-Atlantic Highlands. We're currently being used in support of the upcoming El Yunque National Forest revision in Puerto Rico. And we're also being developed for use for the upcoming Southern Sierra National Forest um, revision in California. But we really have more applications and have expanded since then to include uh, NEPA analysis and responding to public comments. We've had requests from NEPA coordinators in the southern region of um, recommending peer-reviewed literature to refute public comments about climate change and carbon sequestration. We also work with private and state level forest management, um, specifically the North Carolina Forest Service and their stewardship plan program. But as I'm sure you can see, Takamo is really good for everyday use. Anytime you want to um, self-educate about climate change, just get up to date on the newest literature, or have any kind of question about climate change and resources, Takamo is a great place to go. So Takamo, at its most basic level, is really a literature review tool. So it starts with a question of a natural resource professional needing to perform a literature review of climate change science. And of course, this is what uh, natural resource professionals look like in the field, definitely very educated people doing their jobs. But sometimes when we're approached with a question about climate change, we feel a little bit like this guy. And of course, this is where I say, Simpsons all right reserved, Fox, please don't sue me. Um, <laughs> but you know, climate change is really a new issue, and it's something that people feel is perhaps out of their expertise. Um, and climate change is, of course, something that touches every area. So for the literature review process, we think about a traditional literature review. You start with a question about climate change. And the first thought might be, oh no, what do I do? Um, you know, I, I don't know about climate change. So you might try to perform a traditional literature review. Get some papers, call some people, read some more papers generally get a little frustrated here. But eventually, you end up with your solution, that woohoo moment at the end. But with Takamo, we're really trying to make that process easier. So you have a question about climate change, and you know where to go. You know, I'm going to get on my computer and start with Takamo. And it's like having Lisa Simpson up in the cloud helping you with your literature review. You get a nice Takamo report to take with you and get to that woohoo mo moment all the same, but with a lot less uh, pain in the middle. So we're going to stop here for another little poll, and I'll let uh, Emrys lead this off. So what is the gold standard of literature for inclusion um, in TACMO? And we'll go ahead and uh, let everyone respond.
And then we can go ahead and publish the results. So the, the response there is fairly unequivocal. Uh, strong, majority 71%, and, and more than that, uh, probably, recognize that peer-reviewed literature is the gold standard. Um, decision support frameworks are process-driven, and they frequently require documented review of best available science. For federal agencies, this is science which has been subjected to a formal peer review process. This, of course, doesn't excuse them from considering other sources of information, but it is the highest and best standard and the one that we hold ourselves to in TACMA. So at, at this point, we can pause just briefly for any questions for clarification about the tool itself before uh, we dive into some case studies that Lisa will, will lead. All right, it looks right, like looks we don't like have any questions any so far. Oh, I see one here. Um, how often is the literature review updated? Um, well, I wouldn't say that it ever gets updated, but it's constantly added to. So each day, our content developers are adding more information. And then about every six months, we have an internal quality control review where we go back to sure, make sure everything in there makes sense and that it's organized correctly. So besides our six-month review, it's being updated really every single day. Are there any more questions out there before we move on? All right, I'm going to get started with going through our case studies. You know, how do you actually use Tacamo? So as I said, using Tacamo starts with a natural resource professional needing to perform a literature review of climate change science. And for this example, the professional is interested in the impact of climate change on plethodontid salamanders to include in a review of salamander ecology in George Washington National Forest. Plethodontid salamanders, if you're not familiar with them, are lungless salamanders. They actually do all of their respiration through their skin. And their skin, of course, has to be moist for them to be able to respire through it. So they are very sensitive to temperature and moisture changes. So definitely a species of interest in the George Washington National Forest region. So when you have a question like this, your, your first idea might be, um, how is it going to change in the future? Let me put some bounds of a future climate on this problem. So you can look at our Geospatial Explorer, which is an interactive application. You can see uh, we have map layers that you can turn on and off for different decades. And we also have um, a function where you can click anywhere on the map, and it will pop up a graphic for um, the temperature and precipitation ranges for the future there. You can also go to our climate report and get a take-home report. Uh, for this one, of course, we can type in George Washington National Forest. But it's also available from the lowest level of county up to state, of course, national forest, regional, and then at the national extent. And you click Run Climate Report. Within a minute or so, you have a long report telling you about the climate for that place. So it starts out with an introduction about what the models represent and what the different emissions path represents. Then it will uh, outline the hottest, driest, and coolest, wettest predictions with a series of graphs here. So you're able to determine you know, kind of what, what are the bounds of conditions, how hot could it be in the future, or how wet or dry. Using these results, you can craft a summary statement that you can include in your document. So this is actually from the George Washington National Forest Plan Revision. And they say that based on TACAMO, the predicted changes can be shown in these tables. And that these tables describe that all models predict an increase in precipitation from half an inch to more than four inches, and a temperature increase from 2.7 to 5.2. So very quickly, you can go from geospatial layers to a summary result that you can include. And of course, you have this peer review uh, paper to cite. So the next thing you might want to do is investigate the effects of climate change on these salamanders. So you go to our literature explorer first, kind of that 
free exploration environment. And here, we've typed in plus adopted to the search bar. And we can find any quote within Takamo that references plus adopted salamanders. And this comes up with about 10 quotes or so. An example of something that might come up in this is this quote from Milanovic 2010 that talks about by 2020, so in the near future, even the most optimistic models projected at least a 20% reduction in suitable climatic range. So you can see that you know, there are strong effects that are happening soon. And I welcome everybody to play with the Explorer on your own time. You can also go to our structured reporting tool and spit out a report that you can take with you later. For this uh, report, you get to select your resource area or factor. For this one, we would select animal communities. Your category within the factor, so we select amphibians, of course, for salamanders. And then select your region that you're interested and content resolution, which is just how general do you want the information or how specific do you want the information. And then again, within a couple seconds, run report. And you have a long report spit out for you with all the effects of climate change on amphibians in the areas that you're interested in. So we start in this one with, again, outlining your selections and a little background and disclaimer. And then we go through with the effects quotation, the management options quotations, which are matched with the effects based on the factor, the category, the region, and the content resolution. And then at the end, we spit out all the sources that are numerically referenced back to the quotes. It also provides that supporting, supporting literature citation at the end. So as you can see here, there's really a lot of literature associated. And this is just amphibian quotes in the east and southern regions. Even though it only comes from about 10 primary sources, there are about 20 to 30 more secondary sources that you can also look into. So using these. Um, Takamo results from the literature review and explore. You can make, again, summary statements. You know, perhaps quotations from Rodenhaus identify the negative impacts of temperature and soil moisture on these salamanders, whereas Milanovic predicts significant, significant declines as soon as 2020, with perhaps all losses in the southerly high elevation distributions. And then ma identifying management options, another paper, Shu et al. suggests supplementing naturally occurring shelters with additional logs and debris, perhaps restoring riparian veg vegetation, and increasing connectivity. So these management options, as you can tell, are really not anything new, but perhaps management options that are already accepted but applied differently and in a climate change context. So if you're looking at management specifically in a national forest, and this example is George Washington, and one of the management options looked at riparian restoration, you can go to our Forest Plan Explorer, and you can type in riparian. And you can find any design criteria, which are kind of those standards and guidelines that addresses riparian conditions and kind of see, well, can I do restoration activities in this area on this forest? So that's, um, that's a little case study going through how you would use TACMO from start to end. And uh, we're going to have another poll here, so I'll turn it over to Emrys. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so is good forest stewardship and natural resource stewardship generally good climate change stewardship? OK, I think we can go ahead and publish those results. So again, unequivocally, for, for those that responded, um, yes. And this is true. Generally speaking, forest stewardship that promotes a healthy forest is a good no regrets approach to dealing with current and future stressors, including climate change. For instance, all the management options identified in the previous example for salamanders were already accepted management practices, just applied a little differently in the context of climate change. So. 
Uh, we'll go into another case study now that Lisa will lead. Hey, thank you, Emra. Um, so the other case study that I just presented, of course, was a federal one, but I wanted to talk uh, more specifically to this audience about using Takamo to inform forest management for a landowner or uh, just anybody doing general forest management. We've been working with the North Carolina Forest Service this past six months, and they have really been our first non-federal user group. Um, and they were interested in making TACMO more accessible to the public, specifically within their forest stewardship plans that they do, about 5,000 of per year. So, so a large audience there. And may, perhaps not everybody in the stewardship program wants to address climate change, but if they do get that question, they want to be prepared. And they also want to just let people know that it's out there and that it's happening. So this pamphlet um, was targeted at private forest landowners. And the key was creating a climate change document that doesn't mention climate change. A lot of these landowners, they hear that you know taboo word, climate change, and they just say, oh no, I don't want to hear any more about it. So we called this Emerging Forest Threats for North Carolina and Management Options for Healthy Forests. And um, this is not available yet, but it will be available in actually just a couple weeks. But um, we start out with kind of setting the stage, why does it matter to me? And as most of you know, um, private forest landowners are the largest holders of forest land in the southeast. So they're, um, participation in creating resilient forests is really going to be key to maintaining the health of our forest ecosystems in the south. So after setting the stage, we start with kind of giving them those top emerging threats for the southeastern US and try to put this in terms that they recognize. Forest health, wildfire, timber, water, all the things that landowners and managers deal with on a daily basis. So for instance, for forest health, um, you know, one of the effects of climate change is that many forest pests are limited by winter freezes. So increased temperature could increase the number and a negative impact they would have on forests. And invasive species such as kudzu that have high tolerance of harsh conditions may rapidly move into new areas. Um, another example, wildlife. Um, one effect is that large mammals, such as deer and bears, because of the increased temperature, might see a decreased need for winter food. They don't have to build up as much fat in the winter. Whereas birds, on the other hand, could see a decrease in population size as heat stress makes migration more difficult. Um, after kind of outlining those general forest threats for the southeast, we focus on North Carolina and those regions, try to really bring it home to, to issues that the landowners know about. So for the mountains, high elevation forests, um, if you're familiar with the Smoky Mountains in North Carolina, the spruce fir forests are really ones that are on the front line of climate change. And with species moving upslope, they are um, definitely going to have to be one of the areas where we target invasive species removal. Um, for the Piedmont, we focus on water quantity. Um, the Piedmont area of North Carolina, at least, is, is our most populated area. And in a region where stream flows are already available, um, climate change will mean that more streams are seasonally dry and we'll have to watch re reservoir levels. Um, for the coastal plain, we focus on sea level rise. And in North Carolina, sea level rise over the last century has been rising at over an inch per decade, but it's expected to continue to rise and perhaps at an increasing rate. So our forest landowners there might be concerned about saltwater intrusion into their aquifers. And so we give you know, management options of planting more salt tolerant trees like Atlantic white cedar. After outlining these threats, uh, you really grabbing their attention, we talk about forest management strategies to address the threats. And of course, as Emrys um, said earlier, you know, sound forest management practices are good for climate change. There isn't too much of a difference in creating resiliency for climate change as creating resiliency for you know, just other issues. Um, so timber management activities provide a really good opportunity for forest managers and landowners to adapt their forests to multiple threats. 
you know there's going to be a harvest, a disturbance, this is a great time to plan for the future and take in these future um, expected changes. And including adaptation may provide multiple benefits, and it doesn't have to be costly. Just some small changes to management plans um, can help in the face of climate change. So for example, during site preparation, you might want to keep some residual vegetation on site to keep help, help keep soil temperatures low. You might want to think about spacing your beds wider so that they can minimize future threats from drought and insects. For fertilization, of course, there's the issue of nitrogen deposition that we need to take into account. Um, you know, planting is definitely one where people have a lot of opportunity to choose the best mix of species. Um, with climate change, we really want to think about diversity both within species and among species. Um, monocultures of the same genetic origin are going to be the most susceptible to future threats. Prescribed fire, um, a very important tool in the southeast, and it will remain a very important tool. But we might have to modify how we do it as bud break occurs earlier in the year and conditions make the timing of prescribed burning change. And then at the end, harvest. Um, you know, we might want to think about shortening rotation lengths. Um, or if you're thinking about carbon sequestration, you actually might want to lengthen the rotation length. So we present these um, ideas in a way that's in common language, easy to understand, things that people can actually do in their day-to-day -day management. And of course, we end this with, you know, although we encourage forest landowners to take the potential effects of climate change um, into, into their mind when managing their woodlands, we ultimately recommend that they need to consult with some kind of extension agent, county forest ranger, or a consulting forester. Um, so this uh, product, as I said, will be available in a couple weeks. And you'll be able to get it through our case studies page on the website. And on our case studies page, we also have other examples. For instance, um, how Takamo could be used by a NEPA coordinator or kind of everyday use examples. So I welcome everybody to check out our case studies page after the presentation. I'm going to uh, turn this back over to Emrys to kind of give some um, concluding remarks. Thanks, Lisa. And we just want to conclude here um, and point out a couple of things that, that may or may not be obvious. And specifically, to make a distinction about what Takamo is and what Takamo is not. Uh, just like any tool, there are limitations. And it's important to understand these and respect them. Using a chainsaw requires an understanding of how it works and what per personal protective equipment is necessary to safely use it. As we discussed, TACMO is a literature review and decision support tool, a starting point that can help you structure your thinking and better engage your customers, the public, and experts with the most current science available. TACMO is not a push-button decision-making tool or a substitute for local or expert knowledge. And with that, uh, we thank you for your participation. Uh, we welcome any questions that you may have at this time. And if there aren't any uh, questions, we can take the remainder of the time and do a little demo. But let's first see um, if there's any questions that we can uh, address. OK, so I see a question here. Uh, are you communicating with the natural heritage programs about TACMO, particularly in North Carolina? And no, we have not, uh, as far as I know, had any communication with the natural heritage program yet. Um, of course, we are working with the North Carolina Forest Service, who is um, closely paired with Diener and that program. But no, we haven't spoke with them yet. Um, if you are with them and interested, please contact us after the talk. So we're going to do a, a quick demo um, right now um, until we get a few more questions. I, of course, showed you screen captures of the site, but um, you can get to our website uh, a couple of ways uh, through tacamo.sgcp.ncsu.edu, as we have here, or through forestthreats.org slash tacamo tool. Now this is our, our splash page. Um, and we can click Enter Site to enter the main website. You land here on our About TACMO page. So just a little background on 
what TACMO is about. Um, this is part of the About drop-down where all of the other informational um, things are. And so the overview video is something that I recommend everybody starts with. Somewhat similar to the presentation we gave, but just generally a background about what TACMO is. We have a How to Use TACMO page, which is um, just a, basically a listing of all our help and um, user guide navigation documents. So this is where you can get to the main TACMO user guide. You can also see we link to our videos here. The content sources is the next tab here. And this is an explore function that allows you to search through the papers that we have in the database. So Emrys, I'm going to have you type in uh, McNulty. And let's see what we have. Oh, I think you need an M at the beginning. All right, so uh, if you're interested, you know, if you're a scientist and want to know which of your papers are in TACMO, you can come through and type in your last name and see which papers are here. You can expand uh, to see what effect quotation and management option quotations were taken from that paper as well. And then you'll see a Google custom search and tree search button to the right here, which is an external link that will allow you to search through the publication through tree search, which of course is only if it has a federal author. OK, so um, next in the About tab, uh, we have an Other Resources tab, which is um, basically papers that and tools that are not perfect for inclusion in TACMO, perhaps because they're not peer reviewed or are kind of a tool on the, their own. And we cache those in our Other Resources page, just kind of let you know that there are other things out there that are important that might not be in TACMO. And then an in the news page, which um, you know just lets you know the new things that are going on. And case studies, and this is the page that, of course, I linked you to um, from the presentation. But you can see we have different levels of case studies depending on the users, and you can link to them all through this page. Um, the Explorer, of course, is the free exploration environment. And really, the search function is the exciting thing here. So um, you know, we can look, again, at animal communities. Um, you expand to see the description and the components. The components is where you can look at effects or management options. Let's look at management options this time. And so here you can see any of the management options that are associated with animal communities. Um, you can sort them by category. Uh, you can expand to see the effects associated with it. Um, and you yeah, have, of course, sort by region as well. And the source link allows you to jump out to the source and see the citation. And all of our citations are APA 6 edition formatted. Um, so we have a literature explorer also by geographic region, which just allows you to select your geographic region. But once you get in there, the functionality is the same as the other explorer. Um, we can look very quickly at the southern region. So um, for instance, the southern region, we have 164 effects uh, right now. And here again, you can sort by factor category. Um, or if you um, expand here for uh, effect, you get the management options nested under it if there are any. You can also look at the supporting literature citations if those exist, which are those parenthetical citations. All right, we also uh, have a forest plan explorer. Of course, this is more for our federal audience, but we um, include the forest plans from regions 8 and 9, and right now we have Giant Sequoia National Monument from region 5. Uh, we'll look at George Washington briefly, since that was our example. Here you can toggle um, between desired conditions, plan objectives, and design criteria. You can sort by the TACMO factor, and we do associate 
each forest heading that is assigned within the forest plan with a Takamo factor. So, and then you can also sort by forest plan heading. So this is a really unique database because it is the only place where all the forest plans or even multiple forest plans exist. Usually you have to go to each national forest website, dig a little bit, and then you'll find something. Um, and then the GIS viewer, which will open in a separate window here. Let's see, hopefully it won't take too long to load, but um, this is kind of our, our very fancy GIS viewer, uh, ERSRI powered. Um, we have the layers from the three GCMs three emission scenarios, and three time steps that you can turn on and off. Um, you can zoom. Um, you know, pretty much any kind of function that you're used to with a mapping application, you can do with this one. You see the legend on the right here. There's also um, links to, to print and export this map. And Emrys, uh, I believe, is demoing the climate chart. So you can click on any latitude and longitude position, and you can get this great climate chart, um, zooming the access, toggling between temperature and precipitation. And this is something, you know, I welcome everybody to play with this. There's definitely not enough time to, um, to show everything that we have in the GIS viewer in this short demo, but there's a lot there. And then the generator report functionality, you know, these, um, the climate report, as I said, is national, uh, national forest, state, or county, uh, or region as well. Um, and that does run it, and that, that actually takes just a little bit longer to run. Um, whereas our literature report is something that really runs in just a few seconds. So, you know, we'll look at biodiversity. Uh, maybe we'll select all the categories just to see what we can get. Um, select all the regions here. Hopefully we don't overload this with too much information. And click Run Report. And very simply, very quickly, you have a 140-page report. So of course, you know, Getting all the information in biodiversity is a lot, but um, you know there's a lot of information out there, and so we give you the options to sort through it either before or after. And then um, just one more thing on the website before we go to questions. Um, just Emerson, if you could scroll back up to the top of this page, I just want to show you where these help buttons are on the. Um, on the top right here, that's where you can view video help file for the program you're on or a text help file. You can offer feedback or you can read our disclaimer. All right, and I see that there have been um, some questions typed in the chat box. So um, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and answer those um, since we're getting very close to our time here. So um, question from Eric, will there be any efforts to include, oh, chat box jumps down. Will there be any efforts to include Alaska data? I'm having trouble with this. Uh, chat box jumping down. Alaska data north of the national forest. Most of the interior and northern ground is not USFS. So as far as our um, literature review strategy for content development, we don't just for focus on national forests. Our Western um, content developer has recently been working on Alaska content, and it's really just anything in the state of Alaska. So although national forests are our primary audience, um, we realize that Takamo has applications way beyond that, and so we don't want to limit ourselves to just national forests. So we are looking at you know, permafrost and tundra examples in Alaska as well. Um, there was a question about if you know if the LCCs are aware of TACAMO. Um, the California LCC in particular has focused on climate change portals. We are very closely tied to the South Atlantic LCC, um, but we have not worked yet with the California LCC. And as far as I'm aware, um, I haven't heard of anybody in those cooperatives utilizing TACMO, uh, although they are aware of TACMO and what it does. And I'm going to let Emrys uh, answer a couple uh, more of these questions. 
Um, I'll, I'll take the last one first. So are there plans to expand TACMA to include other NFS regions? We're, we're taking this um, sort of on a as interested basis. Um, we've been working um, most recently and most intensively with California, as Lisa mentioned during the presentation. And um, there's, there's quite a bit of interest there actually coming out of state and private um, at the regional level. So I think it's probably only a matter of time uh, before we become engaged with the uh, California Landscape Conservation Collaborative related to the, uh, the other question asked. Um, but really what drives us is interactions with users. So if you're not in one of our supported regions but would like uh, some support, get in touch with us and uh, yeah, we'll explore what we can do, what we have that's already available and what we might be able to do to expand our resources for you. And I will say, um, you know, although TACMA is not fully supported for all regions, we do have some content for all regions and a lot of content at the national scale that applies to everyone. I see another question here that is about substate region on managed forests. Which factors should you explore, forest health or vegetation management? Um, I would. Vegetation management is pretty rich with um, management options and sort of more of the civil cultural aspects uh, and implications of climate change. Um, certainly, forest health is, is a major concern as well, but I, I would probably start with vegetation management. And I see that Ginger Deason also answered the question about LCCs and um, the, the dissemination of, about tacking them out to other LCCs in the chat box. All right, do we have any other questions out there? I know we're getting uh, very close to coming to our concluding remarks from Bob. Uh, I just wanted to see if anybody else wanted to ask a question. So the, the pamphlet isn't quite available, but it, it will be widely disseminated when it is, and that will be in just a couple of weeks. And I will mention one more thing, and, and I think uh, Emrys alluded to this, is we're really based a lot on user support. So you know, I hope that everybody after this oh, yeah. presentation uh, gets a chance to explore TACMO themselves and hopefully uh, can send us some feedback. You know, if, for instance, the person who was interested in future wood production, if you like the information or, or you don't find it useful, you know, we love to hear that feedback. Um, that really drives our content development. Um, you know, the point of this is to make it easy for you to use, and so that's really our goal. Um, and with that, I guess I'll let uh, Bob uh, close up. Thanks, Lisa and Emers, for uh, today's presentation and everything. Let's give them a round of applause. You can do that by clicking on the first uh, icon there below your name. And Give them some applause and everything. We do appreciate everything that you've done uh, in putting this webinar together. Um, one of the things that we do ask participants to do at the end of the webinar is to actually go ahead and um, uh, complete an evaluation. And I'm going to push that out here. So give me a second, and I will get that available for everybody. Your browser should be opening with a link uh, that will take you to the evaluation. Be patient with it. It does take, uh, with 80 people online all at once, it may take a minute or so for it to load. I'm also going to put it in the chat window, so if you have trouble, you can actually copy that and paste it for later. 
and uh, that will get you to the uh, survey to complete in the quiz. So, and with that, uh, I'd like to just thank everybody for their time and effort in putting today's webinar together, and for our participants to take time out of their day to make this happen. Thank you.